Welcome to Beyond the Box. Inside, outside, upside, downside, beyond the box. Our guests are insiders, now on the outside and the right side, dropping truth and nuclear intel bombs and breaking it down just for you. And now it's time to meet your hosts and co-hosts. Your hosts of Beyond the Box are Brenda Lankarch and Suzanne Hot. Brenda Lankart is host of Beyond the Box and retired law enforcement. Joined by Suzanne Hott, host of Beyond the Box, Joel's Indoor Arena and Event Center, and White Horse Productions. They are joined by co-hosts Tom Althaus, Brian Sang, and Penny L.A. Shepard. Brian Sang, co-host Beyond the Box, is Total Disclosure Now Movement. Tom Althaus, co-host Beyond the Box, is the real author of The Matrix, The Immortals, and The Matrix Redeemed. Break it down. And Kenny L.A. Shepard, executive producer and co-host of The Awake Nation, Dark Outpost, Patriot's Perspective, and Beyond the Box. show is for entertainment purposes only. Inside, outside, upside, downside, beyond the box. Beyond the box begins now. Hello, hello, everyone. Today is uh, wait a second. Today is uh, March sixteenth, twenty twenty four, and this is our seventeenth episode of Beyond the Box. And tonight we have a special guest, uh, Miss T. A. Powell, and I'm gonna let her tell you about herself and. Of course, we've got Miss Susie. Hi, Susie. Hey. <laughs> hey, everybody. You have a good day? Yes. Uh, I had a lazy day because it rained all day today. So it was Happy a good catch up. <laughs> all right. Let's bring out, um, I'm going to bring out our executive producer, Penny L.A. Shepard. That will be me. That will be you. <laughs> <laughs> How's your day today, Kay? It was good. I was. It was very busy. I uh, had an opportunity to talk with Tom Althaus. We did a show before this uh, where we went on with uh, Jesse Hall from, um, it's the linked, I, I always get it wrong. I always say LinkedIn, the missing link. Um, and we just had a, a kind of a round table. And this evening we're going to be joined by a person who I have had the honor to interview on many occasions on our show. Um, she's a writer. She's also a theater, uh, executive producer in a theater. And um, she is what you would call a, she's a psychic intuitive, but she's taken that to writing um, extraordinary uh, books. And um, let me just see if I can find her. I think I sent it to you. I'll just give you a little bit of a, a little bit about the, this one book that she wrote. It's called The Deadline, Confessions of a Dixie Mafia Assassin, an investigative memoir by T.A. Powell. Not everyone who dies rests in peace, and not everyone who rests in peace remains silent. That's something the souls of the dead say the Dixie Mafia of the Golden Gulf Coast has apparently forgotten after 52 years, wallowing under the misguided mysteries of a broken family and the Mississippi mud that slogged through their veins. The indomitable daughter of slain Lieutenant Dan Anderson, Phyllis Anderson Cook, and investigative forensics author Powell are ready to expose newfound evidence about the previously known and unknown 
participants of the cornbread cabal's two greatest murders of revenge, the infamous night of the Buford and Pauline Pusser ambush on Miss, uh, in Miss, Mississippi, Tennessee state line. And if you remember, that was the Walking Tall series. And the assassination of Gulfport, Mississippi's Judge Vincent Sherry and his politically active wife, Margaret, with never before revealed firsthand eyewitness testimonials and fact pattern evidence, the investigative author has been able to provide a positive and corroborative seed to the memory of the men of the West of the Gulf Coast sinister history that the public has forgotten, but spirit has not. She speaks about the uh, erythral soul of the Dixie Mafia, Maven, and victim Calamity Jane, whose own murder begged to be solved. Powell has used both investigative forensic skill sets and the shorthand of the dead to assist Cook in connecting the dots between the alleged suicides of her father and brother to the graveside guardians of the local law enforcement who were hired by the Dixie Mafia to ensure their silence about the night the lights went out in Mississippi. In tandem with dedicated field researchers and Dixie Mafia victims brave enough to step forward, forensically based discoveries have been made by Powell that supports the supposition of assassination for her client's youngest brother and Dixie Mafia embedded father. But neither psychic medium detective nor Cook were satisfied with just providing, I hope I'm saying this word right, Sieg? She'll tell me. They wanted justice and it came from the, the most unlikely source, unable to rest in the Mississippi mire. The spirit of Calamity Jane came through time and time again to describe her killers, her place of burial, and the dirty cops that watched her killers destroy her headstone to hide her final resting place in the criminal activities that they were all involved in. And with that, let's bring in T.A. Yes. Good evening. Hi. Hi how are you doing? Good. Good. Yeah. So. You, that's you are an important person, T.A. I'm a what? <laughs> you're an extraordinary person. Oh, you, you're just always so kind about everything. Well, because just, you are. Uh, I just do what I do and hope that it works out for the uh, greater good. So, so tell, so, us, tell us about, about yourself. yourself and, and did you know you were psychic? You, know psychic like child? Um, you know, everybody likes to think they're special in their own little way. Um, I just knew that there was something different in the sense that I would I would know things or sense things, but you know, it's like everybody else, everybody assumed everybody else had that same thing until you find out that everybody doesn't. And then you go, oh, <laughs> ruh <-roh." laughs> And uh, didn't really know what I needed to do with it. Uh, I find it very funny. I'm looking at your background here and some of these arrows are looking just like 777, which is interesting because I also do numerology. Um, but anyway, I'm a, I'm a, so yes, ma'am. I'm a seven two. I know you are. You and Six I have one, a lot in seven seven nine nine seven seven one. Yep. Oh, I'm really really good. Do what now? I'm bouncing, I'm bouncing back. back. Yeah. Uh, we, you and I have a tremendous amount of things in common, which is kind of frightening. But it's also um, it's it's also very much destined. So she and I were supposed to meet and uh, that has been very clear since the first day that we did meet and every day after. So yes, uh, I told Susie. Told Susie to work together. Yes. Go ahead, Brenda. Oh, I think you're muted. Are you muting so that we can talk? <laughs> I am muted. Okay. Well, I was going to uh, say, because I can do a whole lot of things, but I don't read lips. So. <laughs> I do international sign language, though. So if you want to flash some of that, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> um, if you can move your, either move your mic uh, a little bit away from your speakers or turn your speakers down just a hair, because that's why Penny's bouncing back. Okay. That's probably, yeah, that's, Penny, say something. I'm good. It's not. I don't think it's my mic. I right. I've done hundreds of shows like this. So, is it my I mic? I don't know because I know it's not coming back when I talk, and but it is when Penny talks. I don't know what's well, going let on. Let me turn my volume down. Okay, maybe that's it. <laughs> if you'd all just stop yelling at each other. I know, right? <laughs> 
I'm just kidding. We're like a whole gaggle of women in here clucking away. Look at us. Well, it's quieter. <laughs> Say it again. I'm still hearing, I'm still it. hearing it. So am I. It's a feedback I, loop. Not my, my mic is down, down very, low. very low. Yeah, I don't know what's Do going on. We need to test nine again. Is that a problem? I don't know, Penny. What about hers? Maybe turn, maybe turn yours down just a little bit. I guess I don't. I did turn mine down. Hi, Norma. <laughs> okay, let's see. Try it now, Penny. Uh, okay, so. Uh, okay, so. Yep, nope, nope, still going. Still going. I don't know it's why. It's a loop somewhere in there. That's weird. We got. We I'll got just mute until I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead, T. Go ahead, T. Um, so, what else do you want to know? <laughs> I really? have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can tell you that um, I didn't actively begin working with my gift until after my parents passed, and then when my mother came through the night of her passing, it was um, it was one of those moments where you you kind of make a fleece with God, where you say, as long as she is part of the package, I will do whatever you ask of me. As long as I'm protected, I will do whatever is asked of me from my guides, divine and otherwise. So, yeah, I've, uh, that's I've kind of done this. I've done this. I've done that stuff since I was five. And, uh, and my, my mom didn't like it. My grandmother was telepathic. You didn't ever think anything in front of her. She'd walk behind you and slap you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, what? <laughs> She'd say, I heard that. <laughs> but uh, when she passed away, I kind of just stopped doing a lot of things because she was my support system. Mm -hmm. And um, but the only thing that never went away was people passing through or coming and saying, am I dead? And my answer to them is you came through my wall. You're in my room while I'm in bed. So my guess is yes. And and you don't need to be here. There's a place for you to go. <laughs> Just move along. <laughs> I mean, you're very but, kind. I just look at my watch and I went, oh, 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 it's after hours. <laughs> oh, I've had to set I'm those boundaries. You'll have to go back tomorrow because it's oh, like yes. after five. <laughs> yes. I set those boundaries. I try to make sure that when I'm out somewhere talking to people, they don't bother me because I would look stupid sitting there talking to somebody and then look up and say, I can't help you right now. So, yeah, no boundaries. When I have my time, leave me alone. They, they come some one night I was sitting here on the show and this guy just hung around in my living room and waited for me to get done. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> well, that was very polite of him. <laughs> yeah. Now, no. now I'm going to ask a question. Sure. Sorry about the, Sorry about the, Sorry about the slap back. Um, um, so, so when did when you did first you discover, because you told me a story about a CIA, CIA guy that, that you told him about himself. Oh, you know, that's well, funny because you? I had people over here for dinner and they just left like right before this thing. And we were discussing that very, that very story. Of course you were. Of course you were. <laughs> I swear to God, every time we could oh, like, no. we could go years <laughs> and like not see each other. And I, I mean, literally not more than 30 minutes ago. Somebody was like they had they had gone through the house and I have I I love antiques right and so they were talking about they said oh there was this beautiful chair up in one of the upstairs bedrooms and I said ah oh, yes the pink pl the uh, plum leather wing chair and they said oh my god that's so gorgeous and I said yes and they said you must love that and I said I I I've only sat in it twice and they were like what and I said. It, because it did, it literally didn't have anything to do with the chair. The chair was the vehicle by which I was being set up to meet a former CIA agent. And um, it was really kind of a funny story because uh, I was just looking at my phone just to, for no particular reason. And this thing kept popping up and it was this pink, I keep saying pink, it's not pink, it's like plum, 
It's a leather wing chair. It's a very nice wing chair and it's a recliner. And at the time I was thinking about replacing my writing chair at my writing desk. And uh, so I looked at it and I went, well, that's just a little bit too frou-frou for me. But uh, at the same time, it was kind of cool. And I thought, oh, I'll check it out. And and the person, it, it was just a phone number. So it had not been denoted. You didn't know male, female or whatever. And um, it was really funny because they said 50 dollars or better offer and I went okay well so i texted the number and i said well my best offer is zero because like <laughs> i haven't seen the chair so i don't know if it's worth it and they wrote back and they went only taking like serious inquiries and i said well i'm serious i said if it's worth something i'll pay 50 bucks but if it's not i might pay less and so they were like did you want to see the chair and i said yes and i said how about tomorrow night like after six because at the time i worked a very very far away from where I was living. And uh, I said, my travel time will take me. It'll be after six, six thirty, kind of thing before I can get there. And they were like, okay. And then that very next day, um, and this is where the theater part comes in. I am a theater director and we were pulling props and I had assistant who was working with me and we were pulling props out of um, some of our cabinetry. And when they did, and I still don't know where some of these came from. And I've been there over 20 years. So I know everything in that building, literally everything. It probably came in by me. And so there were two feathers, two white feathers that dropped to the floor, followed by two black feathers. And so I looked down and I went, oh. And my assistant goes, oh, my God, is this one of those things? <laughs> they all freak out every time I get a look on my face. They're like, oh, my God, you know. And I went, yes, this is one of those things. And they were like, oh my God, it's a black, am I going to die? I went, no, you're not going to die, you idiot, unless you don't put things away when you're done. So please just put the stuff back in the uh, cabinets. So we went through the whole day and they were like, you got to explain this to me. And I went, just, you know, it, if it involved you, I would, but it really doesn't involve you. So we were leaving the theater and the, the, suddenly we just had a terrible, terrible thunderstorm. And it was just awful. It was like ground to sky lightning. The clouds were really low. And so I, the police, all of a sudden there was like ambulances and fire trucks and cop cars and just, you know, everything. And uh, so they were holding traffic. And so I sent the individual a text and I said, Hey, there's just absolutely no way. I don't know what's going on. I'm assuming that there's been some sort of a terrible accident. And I knew because I had received the two feathers earlier in the day. So I knew there had already been two deaths. I just didn't want to say anything because the other person in the car with me was very young. And, um, so I said, I'm sorry, I won't be able to um, get in touch with you. Uh, what about tomorrow? And they said, no, I can't do it tomorrow. What about Saturday morning? And I went, okay, that answers my my two white feathers because the way feathers work for me are they're not only the hellos from heaven, which of course all of us know are you know kind of that international sign, but for me it's when I'm working on a case it represents a 24 hour period, and it also is kind of like um, a heads up you're about to get information so I need you to pay attention. And the fact that I had gotten two feathers was telling me that my information was going to come through in about 48 hours. And so I noted that the fact that this delay in seeing this chair had gone from 24 to now 48 hours. So I knew it had something to do with the chair, but I wasn't quite sure. And so um, the person said that would be just fine. And I said, all right, terrific. And so uh, when they finally, when traffic started moving a little bit and the cops were finally letting us go through, there was a car that cut us off and it was a white Mustang with a tan rag. And of course I had had one of those. That's one of your like fried green Tawanda, you know, moments. And, and uh, anybody who's seen that movie knows what that's about. Um, so I had that same vehicle. And now normally I probably would have sworn like a sailor that I got cut off by somebody after waiting 45 minutes to move forward. But, um, I'm, I'm accustomed because that's how they deliver a lot of information is through the numerology and through license tags. And so the person who was with me in the car, he was like, geez, I can't even believe that person just did that. And I said, no, it's okay. It's cool because they were supposed to do that. And they said they were supposed to cut you off. And I said, yes, I just need you just read the license tag. And they were like, why am I? I said, just read the license tag. What does it say? And he goes, well, it doesn't make any sense. I said, well, what does it say? And he said, angel blue. I said, okay, so it makes perfect sense. And he said, 
Why does that make sense? I said, well, because if you know your archangels, angel would be Michael, archangel Michael, his signature color, his aura is blue. So it means that my information is coming from an individual 48 hours from now named Michael. And that's all I needed to know. They needed for me to understand that. I said, so don't, you know, don't worry about the rest of this. And so two days later, you know, the following, well, Saturday, this was on Thursday. Then on Saturday morning, I went and uh, I saw the chair and it, we uh, haggled over the price a little bit. And I said, well, what, uh, what exactly is wrong with this chair? And he said, there's nothing wrong with this chair. I said, well, then why are you getting rid of it? And he said, because my wife decided that she wanted a reading nook in the bedroom because the grandkids were driving her crazy and she couldn't concentrate with the television. I said, okay, so what's wrong with the chair? He goes, not a damn thing. He goes, I built her the reading nook. I gave her the stupid chair. He said, and it ended up holding dirty laundry because once she got it, she started complaining. She couldn't see the grandkids. She couldn't hear the television. He said, so I said, then screw it. I'm getting rid of your chair. And I went, okay, all right. And he goes, I suppose that's what you want the chair for. So that you can have your little, you know, reading nook. And I said, no, quite frankly, I'm too busy writing. And I was going to look at, at it for my writing desk. I said, but now that I see how low it is, I don't think it's going to work. And he was like, so you're not going to buy it? And I said, I'll no, I'll buy it. And I said, but I'm not going to buy it because of the reasons you think I'm buying it. And he just looked at me. He thought I was really strange. And uh, he says, well, he said, I feel really bad. He said, here, we've been talking. He said, I'm sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. And I said, it's perfectly fine. You don't need to. I already know who you are. And he said, well, how could you possibly know who I am? And I said, well, it, it, it involves a license tag. I said, but the long and the short of it is your name is Michael. And you don't go by Mike. It's only by Michael. And he went, who are you? And I said, that's, that's not that important. I said, just, you know. You want 50 bucks for the car or for the chair. I said, I'd pay 30, but for 50, you're going to have to load it in my Jeep and you're going to have to help me tie it down and all this bunch of stuff. And then he said, so you don't want this as a reading thing? And I go, no, I really don't. He goes, well, my wife's really going to be upset because she loves writers and she's, this is going to really bother her. She wasn't home to meet you. And I said, well, I imagine if she has a plum wing chair that she probably is a Harlequin romance kind of girl. And he goes, oh no, not my wife. She's like hardcore. And I went to find hardcore. And so uh, he said, well, she's a true crime reader. And I thought, oh Jesus, this is just, it almost felt like such a setup. And I said, okay. And he says, so what do you write? And I go, well, I said, I write true crime. And he went, no. So I gave him a business card of mine that actually has the cover from my third book, the one before the Dixie Mafia called uh, Lords of the Harvest, which is, it's an excellent book cover. And uh, he looked at me, he goes, oh my God. He goes, what is this about? And I go, well, I said, just Google it while I, oh, you know, get the back of the car ready. So we were getting in the chair and, and he Googles it and he reads the information about that particular book, which um, goes all the way back to 1945 with the Chicago lipstick murders. Um, through the Zodiac murders, the Columbus stocking stranglings, the Orange County, Michigan um, murders, murders in uh, Florida, Denver, Colorado, just all across the nation and um, the Atlanta missing and murdered children. And so uh, he, he, also the Zodiac. And he, so he looked and he goes, oh, he says, so you think you know something about the Zodiac? And I go, look, this will go a lot quicker if we just say how, what, what you don't know about the Zodiac. And he goes, Oh, I know a lot more than you think I do. And I said, well, I might surprise you just a little bit too. And so he said, okay, fine. He says, do you know who Michael Aquino is? And I said, are you referring to Lieutenant Michael Aquino, Lieutenant Colonel? And he went, Oh, so, you know, and I said, temple of set. And he goes, yes. I said, introduce the Zodiac at one of his little masses. And he goes, okay, so you know some things. And I was like, look, I'm really busy. So can we just like load the chair? I'll even give you 50 bucks. Just let's, let's do the thing and move on. And he was like, no, 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 wait a minute. He goes, you say, you know more. I want to know, like, you think, you know, more. And I went, okay, fine. I said, how about we do the paradise slaves thing? And I'm sure you're all familiar with the paradise slaves 
And then it says, by gun, by fire, by rope, by knife. He goes, yeah, I know all about that. And I said, great. Then perhaps you can explain to me why the word by is written vertically three times and only once horizontally. What was that? What? Well, oh, oh, you don't know anything about that. Oh, okay. So maybe I do know just a little bit more than you. And the guy was like, I've never, I've never, I've looked at that a hundred million times. And I go, mm, well, a hundred million one might have helped. So he was like, so what does that mean? I said, well, it's actually part of a puzzle. It's telling you who killed who by which method and which killer. Because it wasn't one Zodiac killer, it was four. It was part of a cabal. And he went, how do you know this? And he went, well, that's not really important. The important part is I bought your chair and now I'm leaving and I proved I knew more <laughs> than you. And so he goes, no, 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 wait. He goes, there's like, what else do you know? I said, okay, look. He goes, what do you mean it's a puzzle? And I said, pull it up, just Google it, pull it up, look at it. I said, now show me your phone and I'll show you how this works. I said, so you have the P from paradise, right? And then you've got, you know, by gun, by knife, by rope, whatever. And I said, PS, that stands for Paul Stein, the cab driver who was murdered at Cherry and Washington Street in the theater district. Now, the reason why this is really important is because like Penny said, I have a background in theater. So for most people, this would not make sense to them. But because I already have this within my background, I said, to me, that was extremely interesting. And I said, because it actually connects him to another murder. And he was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What are you talking about? And I said, okay, so look, it says Paul Stein by gun. Notice how the B-Y is because one of the killer's name was Bayard, B-A-Y-A-R-D. So Paul Stein by Bayard by gun. And he went, Oh, you know, anybody could just make that up. I went, okay, fine. All right. Let's look over here on the other side. What is the E above slaves? Because it says by knife, by rope, by et cetera, right? So the E is right above the S from slaves as it goes across. And I said, who is ES? And he goes, well, I, I don't know. I said, come on. You know, the Zodiac. Who is ES? And he goes, I, 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 I don't know. I go, Elizabeth Short, AKA the Black Dahlia. He goes, the Black Dahlia. He goes, oh no, they, they, they found it was some, some guy's uncle. I go, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And he goes, how do you know that? And I said, because I actually can, could have shown you physical proof of who it is. It's in the book. And I said, here, this is how you read that part of the puzzle. E S by D, which is from the, the paradise D that's for Duncan. That was the last name of that killer. So it's Elizabeth Short by knife by D, Duncan. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is that um, the N in paradise or in slaves in that by gun, by knife, the N in knife is backwards if you look at it. Because Robert Duncan had a head trauma as a child and was dyslexic, but he also did that bit with the end. So he put it on its side to make it look like a Z. He did that also on, on a play that he published that he wrote himself and did the cover art. So it's in his own handwriting. He, he did a drawing of somebody laying on the table from the Bohemian Grove, which is really interesting if you know about that. Okay because they committed a murder out there in 1976 that involved a silver Mercedes and a lady that they murdered on the altar in front of the, the owl, okay? And so I was trying to explain all this to the guy and he was like, where are you getting your information from? And I said, again, we don't have them. <laughs> you know, it's Saturday, it's my day off. <laughs> I have to mow the yard, I have laundry to do. And he's like, I need to know where you got this information. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. So let's just, let's just call it even. I knew more than you did. You got more money than you thought you were going to get. 
and I got a chair I can't use. But there's a reason why I was supposed to meet you. I said, so you tell me what it is you think I don't know. And he said, well, do you remember when he wrote a letter to the Chronicle? And he talked about two MPs that were parked in a car out in front of the Presidio. And he was going to murder them that night, but it would have made too much noise. And he might have been hurt on the base. So he let them sleep. I go, yeah. He said, I was one of those MPs. I went, okay. He said, my partner and I had finished two shifts. And they were asking us to stay on a little later. And so I made a deal with him. I said, you sleep for two hours, then I'll sleep for two hours. He goes, and we both fell sound asleep. And that was the night, he said, and we were targeted and I was allowed to live and I needed to know why. So he said he had spent the next 30 years, whatever, doing his research. But in all that time, he had never, never discovered the things that I had showed him that day. That's really interesting. What's really interesting is the murders that were then committed after Paul Stein at Lake Berryessa. Remember when they gave a drawing of the Zodiac and they said they didn't understand it was some kind of a homemade, yes. like, okay, so you remember it had the tunic and yep. it had the hood, but instead of having the pointed hood like KKK, it was square. It was square. Yes. Do you know why? Yes. Why? Okay, you're going to love this. Only theater geeks would know this, which is why I said, you know, the good Lord has had me do all kinds of crazy things in my life. And I only understood then why it was important that I did and theater in my background. Because the theater where Paul Stein was murdered was in front of the Lamplighters Theater. At the time, they were doing rehearsals for the Mikado. If you don't know anything about the Mikado, Google it after the show and go to the scene where it's called the Grave Diggers because the grave diggers have a song that they sing in the Mikado. And the costume that the grave diggers wear is the exact same costume that was in the sketch drawn uh, regarding the murders at Lake Berryessa and the Zodiac who wore that. That is a costume from the theater. Two, wow. of, my, two of my killers that were from Columbus, Georgia, one of them was in the Presidio, matches I is perfect match identically physically to the five foot eight hundred and eighty five pound honey colored hair crew cut almond eyes narrow chin, um, uh, also walked with a limb because he had bunions. The two of them were in rehearsals at the time at that theater for the Mikado. He actually borrowed a costume to commit those murders. Wow. Oh, wow. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't know theater, right? Right. right. Because yeah. how many people have looked at that costume for how many decades and gone, well, it was some homemade bullshit or whatever. Well, no, it wasn't. It was a theater costume, and he was the one of the grave diggers in that ensemble in that play that was rehearsing in the theater district when he murdered Paul Stein. In fact, he not only murdered Paul Stein, but then in true fashion, because they emulated Jack the Ripper, also cut off the corner of Paul Stein's bloody shirt and sent it to the San Francisco Police Department to prove the same way that Jack the Ripper cut the leather apron of one of the whores that he murdered and yep. set it to Scotland Yard. Now this wow. guy emulated him so much that his home in the district, in the historic district of Columbus, Georgia, if you were to drive through there, you would see that all of the lampposts, just like any historic district, you have to adhere to National Historic Registry, you know, um, uh, all their rules and regulations. All of the street lamps, the gas street lamps are all the same, except for the street lamps that are in front of his house. Now. He had himself declared dead in 2010. He's still alive, but he was legally declared dead in 2010, although he was seen and identified by somebody 30 days later when he was trying to break into their roof to murder them through a sun a sunroof. But anyway, um, the deal with his house is all of these street lamps are all, all black. They're all the same size. Everything is identical except for in front of his house. He has two very large, well, 
he doesn't have it anymore, but two very large, completely disproportionate gas lanterns. Do you know where they're from? Um, White Chapel, White Chapel in London. Jack the Ripper. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, so we kind of hit on something that Susie and I used to do. Susie, I'm going to cut in here. Do you have any questions? Hang on. There we go. No, I'm just, I'm still just listening. No. Okay. I just wanted to check and make sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead. I got to check on her every once in a while. <laughs> oh, no. If you leave me alone too long, I'll just go forever. <laughs> That's what you're here for. Well, it's and it's a very, very big book. It's a very, very big interesting. Book. It's a very big book. But yeah, it... I'm but it literally takes you through. Okay. So if for a second, if we go back to Elizabeth short, the black Dahlia. Yeah. Okay. They say that the last person who was seen with her was somebody in a Navy uniform. Right. Yes. And right. he went by the name of Jack. Right. Okay. Ripper. Jack the Ripper. Now, now hang on. This is where it gets really interesting because you can listen to me and, or they, your audience can listen to me and go, well, that's a bunch of bull. And uh, how's she going to oh. pull this one off? Oh, no. They are loving it. They're loving oh. it. Okay. Well, you're going to love this. And I apologize because I was sitting in front of a bonfire and I just re realized my hair is all flat and I never got my lipstick back on or anything else. Okay. So <laughs> the interesting thing about this is right before Elizabeth, uh, short was killed, the Black Dahlia. Now, she was a bit of a bar fly, okay? She didn't drive. She rode Greyhound bus or train. So did one of our serial killers, Robert Edward Duncan, who is an American poet laureate, who's, he's perished. Um, he didn't drive. He traveled across the country um, doing seminars and, and teaching and whatnot, and he traveled by Greyhound, and he also traveled by train. He actually is recorded on an audio tape at Penn State, which, of course, naturally, for all pedophiles and serial killers, Penn State seems to be the homeland. Um, they're Mecca. Um, there's an audio file of him giving a lecture. And in that, he tells the students that are listening to him, it's a miracle that I'm even here because, you know, I almost died in Chicago on the great train wreck in Chicago. And I thought, well, son of a bee. Okay. So if you go and you Google the great train wreck of Chicago, it tells you that is in, I believe it was in like December of 1945. If you look at the 1945 Chicago lipstick murders, there were two murders that were committed with two young ladies in December. And then rolling over into January is where we get to Susan Degnan, which was the young six-year-old girl, blonde-headed, blue-eyed. Remember that. This is really important. Okay. She was found. Well, parts of her were found. Let's put it that way. Because she was eviscerated. Okay. And parts of her were stuffed down the sewers. Right. Now let's move. Remember, her last name is Degnan. Susan Degnan. Okay. Six-year-old blonde-headed girl. Um. Susie, just do me a favor, one of you, Penny or Susie, just remind me to go to the active shooter uh, video so I don't forget. Okay. So what happens is, is Elizabeth Short is seen with a man by the name of Jack. Now, one of the physical attributes of this man, Jack, the last person that she's seen alive with, right? And this is something that you can't fake. So this is critical, not only there's patterned evidence with this case, but there's critical physical evidence because the Jack that she was seen with in this Navy uniform, okay, which this guy had been um, discharged for medical discharge, obviously, from the military, but he was missing the left tip of, uh, or the tip of his left pinky finger, okay? You, you can't fake that, right? Right, right. The Jack who was last seen with Elizabeth Short was missing the tip of his left pinky finger. What happened to her? 
She was cut up. She was chopped up into pieces. Her body was faced towards the Degnan Boulevard in California, right? Okay, so you've got Susie Degnan, which is the final victim of the Chicago lipstick. He gets on a train, the exact same train that Elizabeth Short leaves Chicago, headed out to L.A. Okay, now Susie, well, I'm assuming Susie knows all about this, but I know Penny does. Okay, so Elizabeth Short used to hang out at the Owl Drugstore, and we've talked about that with the Monarch Slaves and everything. Okay, and if you know anything about that whole genre and all of that with the sex trade and everything. Yes, all right. So the Owl Pharmacy, she used to ride um, the trolley car that was called the Big Red. Now, all two of these individuals were part of the initial, uh, everybody likes to watch Stranger Things and they all think it's so, so cool and so whatever, but they don't realize how depraved and how real it is. So the original artichoke program, two of these people from the cabal were part of the original members of that. And he is he is heard on tape talking about it. In fact, I have I have a um, and I showed it to you one time, Penny. I have some of his books and one of his books. There's a thing that's called O. Uh, that's an insert in a book by Jess Collins. And Jess Collins was the fourth member of this cabal. He was actually on the Manhattan Project until he pulled off, which is where the Zodiac oh, wow. knew how to build a pipe bomb. Okay, because yeah, not yeah. your average Joe knows how to do that. Well, if you worked on the Manhattan Project, you know how to do that. So that was one of those those little things because those they were life partners after that. Anyway, so she's murdered. The manner in which she's murdered fits similar to what Susan Degnan went through with the exception of he left most of her body parts intact, except for the fact that she, you know, she was separated at the waist. There was no blood left in the body. All right. Her legs were in a form of a V for the divine feminine, which they were all part of the star of Um, And it was facing Degnan Boulevard. What he did do is he took his Navy uniform and he chopped that up and he put that into the sewer the same way he put the body parts of Susan Degnan into the sewer in Chicago, he did this with the Navy uniform. Now, the interesting thing about that Navy uniform is he got the, somebody found a handkerchief from it and it had initials on it. When they traced the handkerchief back to its original owner, they found out that he had been hit up. He didn't want to originally discuss this because he was a homosexual, but he was closeted. Okay. And that was how this guy, our Robert Edwin Duncan, had gotten a hold of his handkerchief is because because they had had a bit of a one night stand kind of thing just beforehand. And he not only got his uniform, but with his uniform actually got one of his monogrammed handkerchiefs at the same time. And they were able to prove that this guy was not the guy who had done it because he had actually gone overseas the very next day. So you have a guy by the name of Jack. You have the physical trait that cannot be faked. You just can't fake missing half of, you know, the tip of your left hand pinky finger. And he fits all of the descriptions of what was seen. And he was on the same train as her coming down from Chicago and they also found that her locker at the Greyhound bus station was right next to his locker at the Greyhound bus station. But what's even crazier, you say, okay, all of that can be coincidence. All of that could be coincidence, right? Each, each. <laughs> Let's flash forward <laughs> how many decades, right? And my killer, one of my killers, um, he ends up, okay, the Chicago lipstick murders, first of all, the lipstick color that he used was red. He left messages on the mirrors and everything with red lipstick. That was part of his MK Ultra, his artichoke stuff. That was one of his trigger colors. Um, the other one who was his, uh, wasn't his life partner, but part of the cabal, green was his, and he's associated with all the Atlanta missing and murdered children. Uh, and I have physical, actual physical proof from all the Emmy reports and everything that can prove who this guy was and where he was getting them and what the cycles were. 
everything, patterned evidence, critical patterned evidence, colors on clothing, um, all the trigger colors, everything. And I can go through that, but that's a whole different thing. I don't want to get too sidetracked. So here we go from Susan Degnan, right? You have this blonde hair, blue eyed, six year old girl. I find, okay, so they come through with what they call, okay, so you know how this is when they just download information to you and it's yeah. Columbia, okay? And they kept saying the word Columbia, 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 and all these feathers, which means, oh my God, so much information, so much information, just tons and tons and tons of information, Columbia, Columbia, Columbia. Well, we finally figured out that Columbia was the name of a video game for, by Bioshock. Inf I think it's called Infinite Bioshock, and it's an active shooter game called Columbia, if you go through all of the episodes of that, so many of the episodes are in tandem. They line up perfectly with so many of the murders that were committed. So I did a little bit more information about this. I found one of the episodes followed the storyline of a little girl, blonde haired, blue eyed. Okay. Exactly like Susan Degman showed her in cages in an underground nursery, which is where this killer, he had a nursery, had two nurseries, one in Florida, one in Columbus, Georgia. And underneath his nursery, he had cages for children for sex trafficking because they used to sex traffic them using the underground sewers in, in Columbus, Georgia. It's they still yeah. do. Yeah. OK. Um, but anyway, so this episode, in fact, I think there maybe are two episodes are the exact thing what happened to Susan Degnan or in these active shooter episodes. And then there's different other murders. And the more I started watching each one of these, I'm like, Jesus, some of these murders are from the Columbus stalking strangling. Some of these are from the Boston. Some of these are from the Zodiac. Some of these are from the Atlanta missing and murdered. And so when I started doing a little bit more information, because I knew what name this guy went on under as a not his alias on Facebook, and I was able to track him. I realized that that name was the same name as the character, the main character in this actor shooter series. And wow. so when I did a little bit more digging into it, I found out that at one point they were looking for new material. So they had a contest they put out and they said, you know, we're looking for new, new material and stuff. And if your storylines are chosen for these active shooter episodes, we'll name a character after you. We'll use, you know, your outlines for these active shooter, mur these murders in whatever, and you'll get a doll and you'll get a this and whatever. So here you have this guy whose name under Facebook is the exact same as the character in these active shooter uh, movies under the name of Columbia by Bioshock. And Susan Degnan makes an appearance in that. Like for, like for real? Not for real, but is the character, right. the small, the six-year-old, yeah. blonde-haired, blue-eyed victim. Wow. Yeah. So it's it, that's why I was saying, don't let me get so far over the rainbow that I forget to come back to the video thing. Because in the video, uh, like I said, there are different episodes. And different episodes depict several different of these murders that I have that I've been able to do. Uh, connect all this information to these killers. So it's really interesting. And as far as like the Atlanta missing and murdered children, they use that same MK Ultra, the artichoke program with their color triggers. So um, when I went to see the FBI, which I've seen them several times now, and it's really frustrating because they're just frustrating. Oh. Because they, yes. Okay. <laughs> because they don't that. Yes. They, okay. Well, you know, I thought I was, thought I was muted. <laughs> Silly me. Yeah. I said it out loud. Um, listen, I, I get it. I look like the lady in Publix who just goes, Hey, I'm too short. I can't reach the coffee. Can you get it for me? I don't look like I have, you know, a brain past that, but it just irritated me. So when I went to see like the first time I went to see the FBI, I went, okay. So like, dude, I know you're just like a desk jockey. And you're sitting on the other side. So I'm going to give you this formal report. But before we, before you throw it in the, you know, the circular file, just answer me this. If I came to you and I said, hey, I know there are five serial killings and I've matched. I have critical physical evidence and pattern behavior. 
plus substantial circumstantial evidence that go hand in hand with all of this, with three of this of, of the five, what would you say? He said, well, I'd say that was pretty doggone good. I said, great. So what if I told you I had five out of five? And he'd say, I'd say, you got yourself a serial killer and you need to be talking to somebody. I said, awesome. So what if I told you I had 23 out of 26 and that's only because I didn't have access to the last couple of files. And he just looked at me, he goes, what are you talking about? I said, I why don't you I'd be looking at you saying, well, then here, take this application because you, now you have a job. Oh, yeah. No, that's not what they said. Oh. I said, here, let's just turn to page 17. What does 17 say? And I went through each one of the Atlanta missing and murdered children. Deja vu. Yes, ma'am. I said this to you before, and Norma said the same doggone thing in the chat, which is this. What? And I've seen this before, been here, done this. <laughs> Sorry, had to interrupt. No, that's cool. It's, it's like cool. Deja vu. <laughs> okay. I've been here before. <laughs> so let me let me see if I have that book on my desk. Yes, I do. Hold on just a second here. Okay. It kind of creeps me out sometimes when that happens out of nowhere. Because it's like right when I said, oh, wow, I've been here before. Norma popped up with what she said. And I'm like, oh, and she did that too in my deja vu. <laughs> well, okay. Okay. So here is my Lords of the Harvest book. Oh, I know. Cool cover. I do my own artwork. Nice. Okay. All right. So just so that you feel better about this and so that Norma doesn't think I'm a Fruit Loop. <laughs> oh, no. Norma watches all of Penny shows. And <laughs> okay. Well, this is, this is important. Cover. <laughs> this is important for... Let me get back here. I have a bibliography that's about 14, 14 pages long at eight font. And it's the older I get, the harder it is to read. Good well, God. this is 746 pages of holy shit. Wow. I need that yeah. book. When you I do need this now, book. I was kidding. I was kidding. Oh, yeah. Here's, here's something, too. Let me see if I can. Penny knows I suck at this. Okay. Can, can you see that there's kind of a map there? Kind yeah. of, but, but you're on the wrong. I know. Map. I do it terribly. Yes. Right here. Yes. yes. Okay. So this is a map, okay, that's in this Columbia video thing, right? Now, this says Columbia's traveling path across the country. Now, if I were to say to you, this cracks me up. Okay. According to the travel travel map for Columbia. The departure list is missing Boston, Massachusetts, Columbus, uh, uh, Ruston, Louisiana, and Marillo, Texas. Okay. But um, it does show this in this map. Okay. That this active shooter lists Columbia, Columbus, Georgia as a hotbed for serial killings. I don't doubt that at all. Okay, you don't doubt that, but has anybody ever even freaking ass heard of Columbus, Georgia, if you don't live in Georgia? Nope. nope. When I say to you, tell me about some, some serial killings, you go, well, in New York and in California and Green River Mile. It's, oh, by the way, Green River Mile has got a couple of them in there, too. Um, <laughs> Red Rock. There's so many. Okay, anyway, um, you wouldn't put that on a map, right? Columbus, Georgia would not be, I mean, you know, hell, I lived in Georgia. Yeah, I can't tell you how long before I figured out there was a Columbus, Georgia, until I learned about these murders. But going back to the Atlanta missing and murdered children, let me see if I can pull this up. I have it in my uh, thing. I love you, Norma. <laughs> okay, yeah. This is all Norma's fault, so we're going to blame her. <laughs> it's all your fault, Norma. We, we got it's you. It's all your fault, Norma. Okay. I may have to pull it up in my in my files. But the bottom line is each one of these victims was last seen wearing something red, a red Afro pick, a red stripe in their shirt, red striped socks, um, red stitching on their blue jeans, standing in front of a sign that says Red's Barbecue. Um, standing in front of a red school building wearing red shoes. 
each one of these victims in the Atlanta missing and murdered children, okay, each one of them was last seen and each one of them was wearing an article of clothing or an accessory, including a ball cap that was red. They also had, quote, and you'll love this as a cop, they kept talking about there was dirt underneath their fingernails. It wasn't dirt. If somebody had bothered to do a damn toxicology report, they'd have found out that it was heroin tar. They kept talking about this black tarry substance. Well, that's because they were taking heroin. And you know what happens when you add heroin to water? It makes a black tar. And they were putting it on their tongues and on their cheeks because it gets absorbed into the system so fast. And they right. get so disoriented that they can do whatever they want with them. Also, they had one of the victims that showed, you know, there were crystals in the blood, right? Frozen at the wrong time in Georgia. Well, that's because this particular victim had been abducted, tortured, taken by Greyhound bus down to Columbus, Georgia, where the Greyhound bus terminal dumps off next to what they called Bucky's Ice House. And he was kept in the ice house and tortured murdered, then kept on ice, and then the body was returned back to Atlanta weeks and weeks later where it was finally discovered, and they kept saying that the body had been frozen. However, the weather in Georgia hadn't been cold enough for any of that to have happened. So there's so much evidence on the Atlanta missing and murdered, and I have tried to contact the Atlanta Police Department and the FBI, and neither one of them are interested because there's a problem there. And the problem is, is that the deputy chief of police at the time, and later than the chief of police at the time, was also involved in the abduction and murders of some of these kids. Makes absolute Makes sense. sense. Yeah. And the reason why at least one of them was murdered was because he had been on the television so much talking about the eight o'clock curfew for children in Atlanta to be off the streets that he was recognized by one of the victims. And that's why he had to partake in that murder. But all of it's in that book and it's all, all explained in great, great detail. And it literally shows you from the ME reports, not only the tar substance, but also yellow plastic fibers. Well, that was because several of them were garroted. And of course, you know what that is. Um, it's, it's not just manual strangulation. It's that they use, they were using that. You remember the jump rope, like back when we were kids, where you had to burn the ends so that it didn't come undone? Yes. Okay. That plastic, yellow plastic stuff, the fibered. Okay. That's, there was about a two and a half inch, uh, not two and a half foot, excuse me, um, piece of that was used as a garage. And um, if anybody doesn't know what that is, that's generally they put a stick or a piece of metal or whatever, and they put it in, they just keep cranking it and cranking it and cranking it and cranking it. They also had a specific chair um, that was used for that. And like, we can go into all kinds of stuff all the way back to, uh, what's his name? Giles DeRay's. Um, who used to wash the body of his victims, feed them their favorite meal before they died, often changing out their clothes. That was another thing that was odd about several of the victims from Atlanta missing and murdered. And that was a practice that was used by these individuals in their killing cabal. Plus the places that they were taken from, like um, the bodies were either found or left at Red Wine Lake, Red Wine Road, there was always a color associated with it. And the fibers from the fabric, not only fabric, but also from the carpeting. And there was different levels of carpet, um, the green fibers and the station wagon. In fact, I have photos of the interior of the station wagon that shows you the hash marks or, um, you know how like when prisoners are in jail and they, you know, they count off the days that they're in there well, in the station wagon that was owned by the Wayne Williams family, and Wayne was involved in the murders, although he didn't actually commit the murders, but he was part of it. And so was his father, who was a pedophile, and his uncle, who was not only paramilitary, but uh, he was the military liaison. Um, in that station wagon, I believe I am the only one. They're in the book, but they're also on my phone and with my attorney. Um 
I have the hashtags of 13 of the known victims that they specifically murdered because they made hash marks underneath the dashboard right by the engine block in the plastic underneath the glove compartment for each one of the victims, each one of their kills. And I have it photographed. So, and there's tons more evidence that you as law enforcement would absolutely freak out. I asked them where the second seat was in the car and they said, oh, well, we took it for evidence. I said, well, then did you get the blood off of the knife? And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, there should be two slits somewhere in the back seat of that second seat. I said, so there should be DNA, there should be blood. You should have some sort of residue that you could, oh no, we don't know anything about that. We don't, we don't have that. Well, that's because you didn't look for it. Yeah. Anyway. I need that book. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, you, you should Google her because she's got a plethora of books, but her uh, investigative. I keep hearing myself hear talk myself back. Can you mute? Can you mute? Do you want me? You want me to? Uh, uh, let's just see. see. Okay, you, okay mute. you mute. Now. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you okay, just fine. I can't even hear myself talking back, but that's okay, I guess. I get so used to hearing the, the slap back. But um, so her investigative skills are not simply immaculate, but she does things the way that, that we do them too, Susie. She does things uh, through the insight that God is giving her, uh, you know, through signs and things and i've been that way ta my whole life uh, so is susie so you know susie when she was uh younger she was she would tell her mom uh, i'm gonna mute myself right after i say this susie she would tell her mom about uh paintings that she was gonna buy and the next day her mom would buy these paintings her mom had an art gallery um susie you want to tell her about that i'm gonna mute that's susie Okay. Uh, yeah, my mom owned an art gallery in uh, Akron, Ohio. So I would have dreams and I would see the painting that, you know, before it come in and I'd tell her about the paintings. And um, that day, uh, an artist would bring it to the store um, to, you know, sell at my mom's art gallery. And she would, she was like, how are, how do I know these things? And I said, how else could I know? But God is telling me, you know, I couldn't know that on my own unless God was showing it to me in my dream. So it was constant. Like I pretty much saw all the paintings, you know, that in my dreams before they came there. So I think it's kind of like the remote viewing thing that a lot of people are talking about. Um, you know, they see things or they, you can, you can go like, I may be going and seeing it before they get there. And then, you know, seeing it in my dreams before it gets there. Absolutely. A lot of, uh, a lot of my stuff comes through that way or they'll, the, okay. The thing I love is the fact that they are so marvelously sarcastic in a lot of ways, which that's totally my zip code. So <laughs> I appreciate their delivery because uh, it's kind of like they give you information and then if you don't recognize it immediately for what it is and they start, you know, like going, hey, idiot, we're over here. Come on, focus, focus, focus. We're trying to tell you something. And you go, why do they keep showing me this? This is, so oh my God. Okay, now I get it. <laughs> so in my books, I told Penny about this all the time is it, you know, most psychic mediums are very sweet and they're so, you know, they're so kind and they always, cause I I've worked with several and they're like, you'll have an aha moment, you know? And I'm thinking, Oh no, no, no girl, not in my life. I have holy shit moments. I don't have aha because when it finally hits home, I go, Oh my God, holy shit. Oh my God. Like, you know, like how didn't I see that coming down the tracks? And so even in my book, when I write, I went, the holy shit pulled into the train station and didn't leave for blah, 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 blah. Because it's just so funny how they'll present something like for the Dixie Mafia book, 
Do we have half a second so I can explain the Buford Pusser thing? You have a yes. whole hour. Yeah. Well, honey, I don't think you want to listen to me. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> do. <laughs> okay. So, like, and it's even in the book. I gave I gave this guy practically his own damn chapter. And uh, it's called uh, There Was a Crooked Man. And we lived on a lake. And so, you know, it's it's rural Georgia, right? So, you know, dirt roads, you know, that kind of thing. And because I do theater, some days when I would be in production, I would go in later than, you know, if I wasn't in production, I would go in early. But I lived an hour and whatever away. So I'd always have to leave really early if it wasn't production. And if I was in production, I didn't have to leave until later in the morning to get there because I didn't get done until late at night. And there used to be this old man that used to go walking up and down the road. I wouldn't see him all the time, but I had just finished that book, The Lords of the Harvest. This one, which has the phenomenal cover. Dun, dun, dun. I just finished that one and I hadn't done anything for about a year. And so I was letting my guides know that if they were ready, I thought I was ready kind of thing. So. I was just like, okay, um, I think I'm done with my sabbatical. If you need to bring me something, just, you know, line it up like an airplane. And so I'm going to work and I'm, I'm driving down the road and I see the old man walking and I, for years now, I've been waving, smiling, you know, doing the do right. Cause that's what you do. I'm from the Midwest. And so he never smiled back. He never responded, never anything. And so that day I just decided I'd had it. And I don't know why, because that's not my temperament at all, but I just rolled up and I rolled my window down and I said, Hey, can I talk to you? And he was like, what? I said, can I just ask you a question? And he was like, who are you? I said, well, I'm your neighbor from down the road, but okay. That's not what we want to talk about. I just, I just want to ask you a question. And he was like, are you lost? And I said, no, I, I just live right down. No, I want to just ask you a question. He said, okay. He said, little miss nosy neighbor who lives down the road. I know not where, what do you want to know? I said, oh, nice, I, nice. yeah. I said, I just, I just want to know, did I like piss you off or something one day? <laughs> and he was like, what? I go like, was it raining and you were walking and I splashed you in the puddle with a puddle? Did I like not smile one day when you may have smiled at me? What did, what did I do? And he goes, who are you? I go, <laughs> Again, I'm your neighbor from, okay, again, that's not what we're here to talk about. I just want to know, what have I done to piss you off that you don't, you don't smile, you don't say hi, and you don't, and he goes, again, little miss nosy neighbor who lives down the road somewhere I care not. He goes, I like to walk. My doctor likes me to walk. So I walk every day. And I don't smile because I don't have one of those cute little plastic things that you young people like to wear. And I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> he thinks I'm young. <laughs> <laughs> How awesome is that? And uh, I said, it's called a Fitbit. And he goes, I don't care. <laughs> so, OK, well, I don't have one anyway. Okay, Again, not the point. Right. And he goes, OK. He says, so I walk every day and I count my steps because I don't have one of your little plastic toys on my wrist. I said, okay, all right, sarcasm, I get you. It's my zip code, I'm with you. And I said, so what's with the stick? And he goes, excuse me? I said, what's with the stick? And he took the stick and he had been leaning it on it one way and then he just flipped it up like that and it went right up and across my windshield and all of a sudden out of my mouth for no, no reason whatsoever, because trust me, this was not premeditated and this is when you know you're channeling, right? And I suddenly looked at him and I go, what the fuck? What do you go don't go all Buford Pusser on me? And he goes, oh. Excuse me? And then in my head, I'm having my own internal dialogue that goes, What the hell did you just say, you idiot? And I just look at him, I go, I'm sorry. I said, But you know, like, well, what was with the stick? And I, he goes, Buford Pusser? Good God, woman. And I go, I'm sorry. Man walking down a road, carrying a large stick. You swung it at me. I'm thinking walking tall, Buford Pusser. And in my head, I'm going, why am I talking to this poor little <laughs> man like this? Because this is so not like me, right? And he just looked at me and goes, Buford Pusser, good God. He goes, I carry this stick because there's sometimes stray dogs on the road. And I went, okay, we'll have a nice day. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I went to work and the whole time I'm driving in, I'm going, what the is wrong with me? Why, why would I do this? I've never talked to this man before. And suddenly I'm accosting him like, you know, he's whatever. So I get to work and it's, and it's like a Monday and everybody's like, Hey, how was your weekend? I said, Oh, it was great. Except for this morning. I just accosted this old man on the side of the road. I don't even know why I said, I'm just like, boom. I said, I called him Buford Pusser. And they were like, what? I go, I can't explain. I don't even know why I said that. I have no earthly idea. So then I get home that night and, uh, my husband was, he was like, well, do you want me to make you something to eat? And it's like 11 o'clock at night, you know, and you're tired and whatever, but you're hungry, but you're not hungry, hungry. So I was like, I don't know. And he goes, what about a grilled cheese sandwich? I said, oh my God, that's perfect. A grilled cheese sandwich is perfect. I'm just going to go in my office and I'm going to like, just check my emails because like I have had the weirdest day. <laughs> and while I'm in my office, checking my emails. He's in there going, so what happened today? You know, you yell at each other across the house. I'm going, you know, that old dude that walks down the road. He goes, yeah. I go, I yelled at him today. Can you imagine that? I yelled at him for walking down the road and not smiling at me. So he was like, why would you do that? I go, I don't know. And then on top of it, I called him Buford Busser. I mean, what is wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> and he comes into my office. He's standing there. He goes, I don't know. What is wrong with you? I go, I don't know. I just, and then I go through a couple of emails. And then I, that next email is the one that starts the book. This one, which y'all love. Uh, I always suck at that. The deadline, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Dixie Mafia one. And, um, and it's the email from Phyllis. And she says, I just saw that you were writing a book on the Dixie Mafia. I'm wondering if you would take my case. My father and my brother, I believe, were murdered by the same person who assassinated Buford Pusser's wife, Pauline Pusser. And I just sat there and I went, honey, I think my sabbatical just ended. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, what? And I go, I told him I was ready for a new case, but... I mean, that's, that's pretty quick delivery. Right, so, I mean, right. yeah. I mean, what are the odds that I accost this old man and I call him Buford Pusser? Cause like I was what, how old I was in high school when walking tall came out. Right. right. And I'm from Iowa. Like <laughs> why would I even, it's not, I mean, it shouldn't have been anywhere in my memory Rolodex, you know, right. it's not like I ever even watched the freaking movie. But it was just all of a sudden they did that. And so, like you say, they show you things. And I've been watching this guy walk up and down that road for two and a half years. And until that morning, I had never stopped and talked to him or whatever. And then I just vomited all over him, called him viewed for Pusser. And then that night I get the email from the lady who says, my, my father and brother were killed by the same people who killed Buford Pusser and his wife. And I went, holy Jesus. <laughs> So anyway, you know, so I totally get where you're coming from with art and everything else, because it's like you just go, couldn't you people just send me a nice little note every once in a while? So it's so right, much right. easier. <laughs> Susie, Susie last, last night, night went to a, a rodeo. rodeo. Susie, you want to tell him what happened? What happened? About the Suzanne and the Susie and the Suzanne. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, that was what your story reminded me. It was kind of funny. Uh, yesterday, I went to this rodeo in Louisiana, and, you know, my name is Suzanne, right? So, the the girl that we went to go watch uh, at the barrel race at the rodeo, we went over afterwards to the trailer, and um, she had some friends and stuff there, and one of the people there reached out and shook my hand and introduced himself to me. And I answered back that my name was Susan instead of Suzanne, which I said, why did I do that? Why did I say my name is Susan? And I was thinking of that in my head, you know, why, why would I say Susan? Cause it's, it, I don't say my name is Susan. I say my name is Suzanne. And all of a sudden I, I look over at my son and I hear the rodeo announcer say, uh, Susan real loud over the loudspeaker. And I'm like, okay, that was kind of weird. Did I just like tap into that and then say Susan before he said Susan, because I didn't say, you know, my name, I was 
So it was like your story. You say the guy's name and then you hear the guy, the guy's name on the phone call later. Same thing. By the way, we were supposed to go to a rodeo last night. Oh, oh God. <laughs> So when you said rodeo, I'm going, son of a <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is just getting a little bit too weird. So yeah. We're all yeah. connected. We know that. I there's no way that we can't be. And even, even if we weren't supposed to be, it's just like, you know, God's just and then last me. night I read a, an article and showed Susie a video about Houston. Their rodeo was interrupted with a storm. And then there was a guy, they were stuck in traffic and he didn't want to be late. So he took his horse out of the trailer and rode to the rodeo oh, on yeah. his horse because of traffic. I was like, yesterday was just a rodeo type of day. <laughs> oh no. I mean, I mean, yeah. really, what are the odds? Because the rodeo literally was on my way to work. And it just, I was like going, gee, we haven't been to a rodeo in a long time, honey. Didn't we go to this one? He goes, no, we went to the one in the Stegman Coliseum. And I was like, that's right. It was in the Coliseum. I said, but they got it out here. I said, and this is so close to home. I said, why don't we go? And then he was like, no, because, you know, we, we, we're we supposed to have other plans or whatever. And I go, oh, I said, I, it really would be fun to go to the rodeo again. Why don't we just go just screw the other people? Let's just go to the rodeo. So when you said you went to the rodeo, I was like, oh, my God, everybody's going to the damn rodeo. <laughs> I don't think I've weird. ever been to a rodeo, uh, except, except for Susan took me to one, one, but, you know, I've, well, played, I've played in a fairground, a fairground where they had rodeos, rodeos but I but never I intentionally. Never, like, never intentionally. <laughs> well, you don't go to them accidentally. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, my God, there's a rodeo here. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, never, never, never actually, never actually you, know, you know, that's what Susie's done, done in her entire life. life. But Susie very, very much so is like, like myself, myself, is like you, like you and Brenda, Brenda is too. Is I thought this I thought would be a very, very good amalgamation for us all to get together, get together and, um, um, and share some information. Share well, I think the key thing is that, it, you know, as long as everybody is aware of what's, you know, because I tell people all the time, they're like, well, how come? Okay, so we recently had um, a very close friend of ours pass. And his wife was just distraught. And um, I just, I felt so bad for her because I know how healing it is when my parents come through and how that changes everything in your life, you know? when you, when you, because then you understand that the connection isn't broken. It isn't whatever. And I was waiting for my husband. I was picking him up from work and I was sitting in the car and all of a sudden her husband came through. And, um, so I went, okay. All right. And he used a nickname for her. Now we've known them for over almost Almost two decades and whatever she her her um, grandfather actually was a judge in the first case the, uh, the ATF agent that I was able to get reclassified to homicide killed in the line of duty in Washington DC her grandfather was a judge who when I was going through the um, the widow's diary that she kept there were several hours missing that night between when he took their kids to Shoney's for spaghetti and then when the murder occurred and there were hours there that were missing. And I found out later on that two and a half of those hours were spent with him visiting this judge who was his very good friend. And he was giving him information that he had found out on the tri-state mafia, although nobody knew that at the time. And so he was the last person to see him alive before he was murdered by the local state and federal uh, agents that were involved in that. Um, but anyway, uh, so we've known him for a long time, but I had never heard this. You know how husbands and wives have like pet names for each other that they don't generally use in public. 
So when I called her, I said, I have a message for you. And I'm, I, I don't, I hope you don't think I'm an idiot <laughs> because, you know, um, but here's what the message is. And it was Neil. I'm so sorry. I'm so terribly sorry. I was just so tired. I just, I couldn't hang on. I was just so tired. And she just burst into tears. And I said, so if this is wrong, I am so sorry. I said, but he literally said the word meal. And I don't think it's like M-E-A-L. I said, but that is, if you were to do it phonetically. And she just burst out crying and she said, no, she says, my name is Camille. But only, only he called me meal and only at home and never in public. And you would never have known that. And I was like, he just wanted you to know that he hung in as long as he could. He was just very, very tired. And she was just, you know, so it's when you get moments like that, I mean, it's marvelous to do these other things with cases for people. And Penny knows I don't charge anybody a dime. I've never charged anybody a dime. I absorb every cost, which is why I'm so freaking poor. <laughs> I work for the government and... <laughs> <laughs> and I do this stuff for free. And um, so I never charge anybody, but it's moments like that when you can give somebody that small piece that takes them from, I can't see to the end of today, but I can maybe now see till tomorrow morning, you know? So those are the, those are the biggest blessings is when you can give that kind of information to somebody. That's what I love. And the other stuff just trips me out every time it happens. You'd think I'd be used to it by now, but I always go, oh, my God, holy shit. <laughs> I'd like I'd you like to you tell, tell, I'm going to move gonna you move just a second, second if I can. Can, can you mute yourself? Can you yourself? <laughs> Not very well. Thank you. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I, like, uh, is everyone muted? I'm still getting, okay, no more, no more slap back. Yay. Um, I would like you to tell them uh, what, how you quantified before you wrote this and before you took the case upon uh was it phyllis that i had on my show okay, okay. tell them tell the them story that. how that happened okay so you're talking about the dixie mafia okay um i don't i don't People are always asking, they say, how do you choose your cases? I don't. They choose me. And um, they always go through this whole little, little thing with me. Um, so like I said, I was explaining the bit about the Buford Pusser thing. And um, I got her email and I responded and I said, I don't take every case. Um, and she wanted to meet. And so we, we, we went ahead and we set up a meeting and everything. And she said, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you all the information, everything you need. I'll give you everything. And I said, okay, but that still doesn't mean that I'll, I'll just don't, I'll, don't automatically assume that I'll take it. And so we met and she gave me tons and tons of information. She was very good. And, um, so we had met at a public place. And so, <laughs> we were leaving and she was like, well, are you going to take my case? And I said, I, I don't know. And she was like, what do you mean? You don't know. And I said, I, I just, I don't know yet. Now to back up by 24 hours, I had been doing some research on the information that she gave me. And you know how, when you're working on your computer and the sidebar pops up and it's like zoo Lily or stuff like that. And you're like, Oh my God, just leave me alone. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Well, it popped up and it was for the Denver Mint. And I thought, oh, really? <laughs> like I have money to spend on stuff like that. But it was funny because it was the Denver Mint and they were showing the bronze archangel statues. And so they had showcased Michael Archangel, who I work with all the time. And he had his, you know, he had his throat and his, uh, his foot on the throat of Satan and the spear at his chest and everything. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I got it. I got it. Leave me alone. I'm trying to do some work. And so I went to bed that night. Before I went to bed, I do the same thing I always do. I, I said a prayer for guidance. And so at three, and you, numerology, you'll, yes, thank you. Okay, Susie, you got it. <laughs> okay. We all talk to Michael. 
I guess Susie's got it. I have. I, I love have that. Little, I have a little uh, emblem over my bed too. <laughs> okay, so you'll love this. Okay, that was cool, Susie. Thank you. So um, anyway, so I went to bed. Now I'm not your. Even though I've been to a rodeo, I'm not really your country music kind of gal. Okay, I'm just not. All right. And so I went to bed and exactly at 3.33, which of course, numerology, <laughs> I know I can see Penny going, oh, stop. Okay. 3.33, I wake up. So I'm clairsentient, clairaudient, clairvoyant. And uh, I don't know, there's a couple other clairs out there. Um, so, but they always like to talk in my left ear. Apparently I don't pay attention if they talk to me in my right ear. Um, so in my left ear, I hear the song, um, you're a fighter. And, and it's, you know, it's like, I'm going, what, what is, what is, I, I heard this song one place. I don't know where I was. It was in a store or something. And I went, oh, I kind of like that song. I don't like country Western music, but I kind of like that song. Right. And I have songs that I call my angel songs because I know immediately when I hear something that that's supposed to mean something for me, even though I don't know why yet. So um, I was like, oh my God, that's that song. So I got up and, you know, God bless my husband. He just goes, where are you going? Oh, never mind. <laughs> I said, I'm going to oh, just never mind. So I went down to my office and I was, you know, I was Googling it and whatever. And sure enough, it's Carrie Underwood and Keith Urban. And they're singing the song, I'll Be Your Fighter, right? And so I start reading the lyrics and I went, okay, well, that's good. But that's just, you know, I need like two out of two or three out of three. Went back to bed. So here I've got <laughs> your Archangel Michael in my Denver Mint. Then I've got the backup of the lyrics from I'll be your fighter. And I'm like, on <clears throat> okay, but I don't need to die. So I'm going to need more. I'm sorry. So I go and I meet her and we go through all this bunch of stuff and we're getting ready to leave. And it's in one of those restaurants where, you know, they have CD racks and everything else for sale. And um, so she was like, well, at least let me buy your, your breakfast. And I said, no, really, I, I, I never want to be beholding to anybody for anything, because if I don't take your case, then I don't want you to go, well, I bought that bitch breakfast. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, I'll, you know, we'll pay for our own breakfast. It's all good and whatever. And then she started to back up and she had this really big purse. And I said, don't be careful. You're going to hit that, that thing. Sure enough, she turned around. She wet the snot out of that. And I just, I grabbed a hold of the thing before it could fall on the floor. And I was like, my God, I told you to be careful. Your purse is like the size of freaking Africa. And she goes, oh my God, I just keep hitting everything. And my husband is like going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, just get me out of here, get me out of here. And he's paying the bill. And then she says, so when am I going to know if you're going to take my case? And I'm holding this, this rack, right? And I said, well, uh, how about we get out of here before we destroy this whole restaurant? And I set it back up and the CDs go. Poof, 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 poof. And there's one left standing. And I turned around. And I went, son of a. She goes, what? What? I said, can you turn that around? Could you tell me if song number seven? What is that? And she goes. Oh, oh, I love this song. This is Carrie Underwood and Keith Urban. This is I'll Be Your Fighter. I love this song. And I just looked at her and I went, I'll take your case. And she went, oh, my God, you're going to take my case? And I said, yes. And she goes, what happened? And I said, well, I told you I needed a sign. I got a sign. And she goes, oh, my God, Keith Urban told you to take my case? Oh, God. And I thought, well, that's better than saying, no, Archangel Michael told me to take the case. So I went, yes, Keith Urban told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was he, he called he me called on the me phone. phone. <laughs> yeah, just right now. But it's, you know, it's so funny how they do that, how they set things up. And normal people would just let that slip. But it's like you go, come on. I mean, what are the freaking odds, right? I'll be your fighter by Carrie Underwood and Keith Urban. But it was so funny when she looked at me and she goes, Keith Urban told you to take my case. <laughs> yeah. He's here in the ethos. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even explain, I didn't even explain that. that. Just like, just like, yes. Yeah. I just looked at her. I said, I, I got the sign I needed. I asked for three out of three and that's exactly what I got was three out of three. So as long as I'm being protected and I'm being guided, then I'm good to go. So, that was, you know, people don't talk about the fact that 
I'm going to mute you, you for just a second. second. Can you mute yourself? You, so? <laughs> you just don't <laughs> like me, Penny. <laughs> Um, I, you know, people, uh, don't understand what is behind all of the, all of the things that get into place for you to make that decision that comes down the road. So to try and explain it to someone is it's, it's lengthy, uh, you know, so probably the easiest thing would have been to just say, yes, Keith called me. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah. Okay. That's it. And, um, and you know, we don't have to explain it uh, all the way to people. I try to explain some of the things that happened to me and it's just, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, when I was in a, a spaces and they started asking me, what are your talents as, as 11? All right. And, and it was, it was not a good space because when I went in there, my friend was in there. Her grandfather was in the Jedi program and her grandmother was in Stargate. Her name is Angela and she's been a very good friend of mine for many years. And she says, because of me, she started researching and speaking out because I told her, you need to, you need to research it and you, you need to get it resolved with yourself and you need to speak it out. She also finds missing children. And uh, I helped her find, I think one person, cause I, I looked at the thing that she was sending me. I'm like, ah, oh. You know, it, again, it was just a weirdo thing. It's like, no, I, there's something with that church and that crossroad right there. Uh, because we see things in pictures. And I've seen things in pictures since I've been a child. Not understanding that it was remote viewing, but actually thinking it was like a modeling thing. Okay, let me explain. All right. So I did modeling. But when you do for your band pictures or whatever promo that you do, they tell you, you know, look in the camera and have a thought and an intent in your mind, right? Because otherwise it's like writing characters that don't have any background. It's just a straw character or you just get a silly, stupid grin on your face. So I always did that. And I also, when I look at the pictures, I say, what was that person thinking? Where were they before they took the picture? Uh, you know, what were they thinking at the time? And then where did they go afterwards? So that's like a, a little premise for me. And I remember when a, when an individual at the Bradford Inn, because I was writing, it wasn't the Bradford Inn, it was the, um, it was the Bradford Inn. I was writing Bradford and Valentine, which I'm going to continue to write, T.A. Uh, we're talking about maybe doing some documentaries and and maybe making Awake, Na Awake Nation, but the Dark Outpost, a vehicle for doing documentaries. And I'm also working with Tom Althaus, who is working with Roseanne and she's talking about making one of his uh, properties, uh, intellectual properties, uh, which is, which was actually what the matrix was made from uh, his uh, property. And he has, he said he's got like 16 other uh, scripts that are more powerful than the one that Hollywood stole from him. So um, I was right. I was in Branson and and I also would just take us aside. I've always talked to Michael since I was a child. And, uh, and when I, and I broke up with a Michael when I was in Vegas and then I went to the top of Lake Elsinore and I screamed at him and said, where are you? And then they sent me an evil Michael who I married. Sometimes we get it wrong, but um, we do, we do listen to signs and to, and to symbols and, um, and so I realized when I was in Branson, uh, someone showed me a picture of my former agent who I found out is my brother with, a, a very, uh, in, a, a very important individual who he represented and one of the, uh, he represented Dos Equis. And so, uh, I said to myself, is that two X's? Like he was my ex, right? And. So I looked at the Dos Equis thing. And then I also said, what is the symbolism that he's doing? Because he was doing this with another guy. And I think that's actually Lucifer, the L for Lucifer. And the other person, their premise was uh, the most interesting man in the world. And so I said, is he saying to me, look at me, I'm the most interesting man in the world? Because that's what we do. We utilize everything that comes into our purview because we know that we're being told things to unlock certain things. That's how I found out also, TA, that I was involved in Project Genesis. And uh, this is a, a short 
story because Susie asked me about it the other day because we were talking about Bibles in a dream that she had. So I go, I, I've had Bibles all my life and I've walked through uh, every, every place that I toured. Uh, I would have a Bible in the car. I played in, in bars. I would talk about Jesus wherever I was, but I didn't cram it down anyone's throat. They came to me and they would ask me questions. So I had, uh, I had these two Bibles which one of them I actually, I threw them out at the point that I realized who actually wrote the Bibles because it made me angry. Um, and so when I'm in Branson and this individual shows me this picture of my brother with this person, and then that's when I start asking the questions. And then that's when I start researching. And then that's when I go back to my first ex-husband and I ask him, um, I say, I think I'm related to John, but I get this information in a weird way, right? And so back to the Bible story. <clears throat> so um, I go into this Bible shop when I'm in Illinois, and I call it Illinois. And I say, God, which Bible should I get? And so he points out this one Bible. So I'm like, okay. So I take the Bible, and I go home, and I start to index it because I know not everybody knows where all the books are, and I don't either. And so I start indexing it and I have this one index, which is for Genesis. And I'm like, where's Genesis? Uh, and so I, I look at Genesis is missing. There's like one page for Genesis, but it's missing. Right. And so I say, all right, I'm going back to the Bible store because Genesis is missing out of here and nobody ripped it out. It just wasn't printed in there. That's the Bible God told me to get. So I go back to the Bible store and I say, mm, I'd like to get my money back. Can I get another one of these? because uh genesis is missing and they're like what i say isn't that kind of the point of the bible genesis is missing it's not there and he says uh well i go look at it i didn't rip it out it's not there so he says well technically it must have been a misprint so i said well i'd like another one please he says well i have to call my manager i'm like seriously genesis is missing dude please just i just want another bible and so he goes back and he looks on the shelf there is no other bible that was the only one of its kind. That's the one I wanted. And so I'm like, well, great. He says, well, we have to order one. I'm like, just great. Then later on, um, I, when I'm researching myself, I go back and I find out the name of my yearbook was Genesis. And I know that they did MK ultra experiments in my, in my, uh, high school. And I was one of them. Because I believe that I, this, the daughter of Joseph Mengele and Irene Schoenbein, that's when I started asking questions. So that's how I found out my project name was my project name was Genesis and the sub project was Eve. That's how God told me a portion of who I am. And then I prayed and I said, reveal myself to me. And woo, that's if you have questions about your life and tell the audience, please pray that prayer. It's a very potent prayer. If you say reveal myself to me, you better be prepared because the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all going to come out. And so I prayed that prayer. And that's when I started my walk and I started finding out about the project that I was involved in, about my, my mother being a Hitler baby. Um, and then, you know, it led to a very happy uh, point in my life where I got thrown in a crazy house for a year. That was fun. And from there, though, because God puts us in places for a reason, a little girl who cleaned out the toilets and listened to everybody, please, uh, said, you need to watch Stranger Things. And I was like, really? Because I just found out my family were Hitler's, Eichmann's, Mengele's, and Spears, oh my's. Not who, too happy to be locked in a crazy house when there's nothing wrong with me and finding out my family is deep state CIA. And then I showed people pictures and five people quit. But my point is, pray that prayer and then do the research. You know, God will, and, and God will give you those answers. Just like T.A. said, he will give it to you in license plates. He will give it to you from the, the, the bark and the demeanor of a dog. He will give it to you in babies. Babies will talk to you. They were very close to God at one point. And, um, or, or the weather or, you know, the motion of trees or a person that comes to you and says something. And Susie, would you like to tell them about the angel guy that came to you and talked to you? about your daughter yeah hold on okay so um i what what i want to talk about real quick brenda was asking me a question because she kept hearing um 
Tool and Lucas, you know, the serial killers. So um, this book right here is called The Hand of Death. Okay. Um, it was a book written by a guy named Max Call. Max Call, um, he sat with he uh, Lucas, Henry Lucas, who and Otis Tool, who are the serial killers. He sat with him and he wrote this book. Um, in this story, I want to show you this picture here. Um, I don't know if you can, uh, well, you can see this, but this is Henry Lucas um, praying for forgiveness to Jesus for all the victims that he killed. Okay, he he had a visitation by Jesus in his cell. Um, and so he came at, out and said he was involved in maybe a thousand murders. Um, and he was in a cult uh, that was run by a military base out of uh, the Everglades. And it was, uh, you know, actually overseen by Michael Aquino. Okay, so my, the satanic organization uh, would meet in the Everglades and train these satanic people. And um, Lucas worked with, they he, they had a, like, I don't remember the guy's name because it's in the book, but he, it was, he was like a third down from Aquino, I believe. Um, and then they were given uh, jobs to do all across the United States, kidnapping children, murdering people. And so they were called the hand, the hand of death cult because they, people would die at their hands. But like I said, in this book, he, he came out and uh, gives all the victims, everybody that he remembers killing and where he killed them and where he buried them. And then there were all kinds of attempts to make him sound like he was crazy after he admitted to all this stuff and like he didn't kill anybody or, you know, this didn't happen or that he would just do it for a milkshake, you know, at the jail. But no, it wasn't. He really was telling the truth. So I think that that truth needs to get out there about all those murders that were done. And if, if Henry... If Henry Lucas had said at any time in his testimonies that he killed somebody, he killed them. That was his honest truth from Jesus. That was so. That's just something I wanted to put out there because and we're I talking. I want to mention, Susie. Can you tell her what happened to you in Jacksonville? Um. Yeah. I I was um, at a bus stop with my girlfriend, and um, they stopped and picked us up. And then um, took us out to the, uh, they were going to take me to my mom's house, but instead they took us out to the woods and I'll just kind of condense the story. They took us out to the woods and um, Tool was driving. Tool got out of the car, asked me to get out of the car. And uh, he, and then he, 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 he said, hold on a second. And he looked into the car with uh, Lucas. Lucas was sitting in the car and, uh, and then I was going to pick up a rock and hit him upside the head because I figured he was going to kill me out there in the woods. And um, but I heard the voice of God say, trust me and a very loud voice. And I looked around. I said, how can I trust you? I cannot see you. And um, about that time, Tool turned around. He was like six foot seven, big old guy. And he turned around and came back and he, he says, my friend is acting weird. And I'm going to like you walk you over to the road and then I'm going to get him out of the car. And then I'm going to drive around and come pick you up. But I knew he was going to kill me. I was, I was in 1979. I was 19 years old. Um, but he started to walk with me. And then he says to me, he says, I'm going to rape you and I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to throw your body in the St. John's river. Everything that everybody's ever done to me, I'm going to take it out on you. And I turned to him and I said, did anybody ever tell you that Jesus loves you? And he says, what? you mean to tell me, I tell you, I'm going to kill you. And you tell me that Jesus loves me. And I said, yes, even if nobody else in this whole world didn't love you, he loves you. Well, and then he tried to grab me. And when he did, I jumped backwards and he grabbed me by the ankle and I kicked his hand off my ankle and I started to run and I turned my head to see how close he was to me. Cause I was getting up to, I was running from him and he was right there about to grab me. But when, um, just at that moment when I looked at him, he slammed into that invisible God that 
you know, then I was like, I'm just talking to this invisible God out there in the woods. You know, I can just hear his voice, but I can't see him. Well, he slammed into the, that and it stopped him dead. And I saw his face get squished on, on it. And I took off running and um, I went to this house and I was hiding behind these bushes. And this old man was and his wife came out um, and said, you know, come in here and call them and the, we'll call the police. And then they called the police and my girlfriend was in the car with them and they drove off and the police came and they said, Oh yeah, we know who they are. He's on probation, you know, <laughs> and uh, he's going to be in trouble now, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't even know who they were. Um, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know these people, but they, the police knew who they were. And, uh, and then, um, <laughs> I mean, here you have these famous serial killers, you know, and it's like, they're just running around. Everybody knows who they are, but you know, um, so that night, my girlfriend, um, I went, they, t I went home and I sat on these church steps all night and I prayed for my girlfriend that she would be okay. And, th and they took her to a motel and Lucas slept with her. And she said that the other guy tool sat in a chair all night. And he kept saying she had God, she had God, she had God all night. He kept saying that. And, um, you know, these are people who were like, uh, the story about tool was he was raised there in Jacksonville, Florida under a satanic family and he he used to go you know for his grandmother go dig up dead bodies and stuff for like witchcraft things and stuff like that plus he liked to eat his victims you know he was a cannibal you know i mean it was like he was really you know where lucas um he was just more of a killer because you know he was kind of raised like in the backwoods of you know and his just his horrible childhood and stuff and then they met so the two of them kind of joined up together and then they ended up going down because um, because uh, Tool was already a Satanist in Jacksonville. Um, he introduced Lucas to the Satanic uh, cult, and then and then he decided to join it. And they went down to the Everglades to be initiated into it. And that's when they joined the Hands of Death cult under Michael Aquino. And then they were you know, going around getting paid money to kill people or kidnap children and take them to Juarez, Mexico, you know, it, it's just, it's a whole, but it's all in the book, you know, so it's all the details are in the book. You're going to have to come back to you. That's all there is to it. But I did want to say how we found this out. Susie, can you mute for just a second? Can you guys mute? So I don't Here, I'll get her. I'll get her. I'll be, can you mute Susie? Okay. okay. Uh, uh, so, um, the way that she found this out because her memories were repressed because this was 40 years ago was I started working with Megan Walsh and I told Susie, this case has something to do with you. I don't know what it is, but it, it has something to do with you. I'm going to find out what it is, but I don't know what it is, but it has something to do with you. So I worked on, uh, I did like 30 shows on John Walsh with Megan on, uh, with David and, um, and so I talked with Willis Morgan and I said, uh, you know, where did Tool live? Because Susie had told me when I first met her in 2018 that and she didn't have any information. She just said, I almost got killed by these serial killers. She referred to them as that. She didn't know who they were, but she referred to them as that. And so I say, uh, Willis, where did, uh, where did Tool live? And he says, Jacksonville. And I'm like, huh. Right, and then I and Susie was getting going through some trauma and stuff, so I had to like pick the right time to ask her. And she had asked me to watch this thing on on Henry Lee Lucas, which was on Netflix, and I was like, really, I don't have time. But I eventually did watch it. But so um, I I read a little bit on Tool, and I think you and I discuss this, Ta. And I said that that's when I realized, oh. She, I, you know, that's, that's him for sure. And his mother dressed him up in girl's clothes with a blonde wig and called him Susan. I'm done. Go ahead, T.A. All of our, uh, the two killers who were active in the cabal in that large book, same thing they were dressed as girls when they were young. Uh, going back just a minute, 
Okay, right before you started talking, they told me to pick up my fluorite. Fluorite is for against negativity and evil. So right before this whole conversation took a turn towards something else, they said, pick it up. So that's what I've been holding the whole time is this fluorite, because all of a sudden it went from being what our gifts are about the positivity to all of a sudden this. And then when you said Genesis, I almost fell out because I also teach besides the theater, I'm involved in another theater and I also teach writing and screenwriting, um, playwriting, but also uh, screenwriting for television. And the project that I gave them um, for this kind of semester type thing on top of whatever was we're doing an adaptation, a modern adaptation of Frankenstein. And Frankenstein owns a research institute. And the name that I gave to his particular project is called the Genesis Project. So when you said that, I was like, oh, baby, uh, because we just finished the script on Friday. So I was like, so first they tell me to pick up the floor, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know where we're going with the conversation, but apparently we're going someplace I need to, to not be in, in, influenced by or whatever. But you said Genesis and I went, Genesis project in the beginning. It was, I thought, oh Lord, here we go. And the Bible was missing Genesis. And I, I also, um, I wanted, I wanted to, to tell, tell you, you let me, let me, can you mute, can you mute for a second? I wanted to tell you that uh, Tom is a screenwriter. Uh, my brother David was murdered. He wrote a screenplay. I am a writer. I've been a writer since I was a child. I'm published. I'm not as prolific as you are, uh, but uh, also screenwriter. My friend Tracy Torme died this last year, January uh, it was either the fourth or the sixth when he was supposed to be on my show. And I'm still kind of heartbroken about it, but he was a screenwriter. He was Mel Torme's son. And uh, he also did uh, Star Trek, the new generation. He wrote uh, fire in the sky with Travis Walton abduction who he brought on. So we have screenwriters around us. And um, like I said, I don't know how, but we're going to be working together because the, I can see the matriculation this year. Things are going to be happening that are very positive things. And, uh, and we're, you know, Tom believes we're going to be able to break some of the timelines that were uh, merged and, and messed with to make a negative outcome for us to be a positive outcome. So um, we're encroaching the end of the hour. We've got eight more minutes left. But you have to come back. That's all there is. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Okay. You just oh, said God. the eighth. Sorry, Brenda. I just want to share this, just this thing. When you said the timeline and everything, immediately in my head, I went, well, it better happen before the 8th of April. Okay. So does anybody know? It's 2024, April 8th. Edward Casey, y'all with me? What did he what say? Did he say? April 8th is an eclipse, okay? Right. But yes, it's yes. extremely strong this time, and it's also right directly over the New Madrid Fault, which he Ooh. predicted. So when you said time is moving faster or whatever, and I'm like, yeah, she better get it done before the 8th of April. And then you go, on the 8th, and I went, oh, my God. <laughs> so anyway, yes, Brenda, please, let's lighten this up. <laughs> Yeah, well, I do want to say one thing. Susie, thank you. I thank you. Lucas, thanks you. For some reason, I was sitting here and out of nowhere, the names in my head, in my head, in my head. So I asked Susie, are you thinking of Lucas until? And she's like, what do you mean? I said, I cannot get their name. I cannot get that name out of my head. And it started making my head hurt. She went and picked up the book and started talking about them. And I heard a thank you. And my head stopped hurting. Apparently talking about serial killers, they feel they need to be in the mix. So thank you, Susie, because now my head no longer hurts. 
<laughs> it was horrible. I was like, oh my God, my head freaking hurts. <laughs> but thank you. Oh, wait, Susie's got something to say. Wait, wait, wait. Go, Susie. <laughs> okay. What I wanted to say to conclude with that is the fact that what Jesus said to Lucas when he visited him in the jail cell, Jesus told Lucas, you need to tell the truth and you need to tell the truth about everybody that you've killed and you need to tell where you buried them because Jesus said, I have to answer the prayers of all the people that have been praying for the, for the truth about their loved ones. So, you know, it's really Jesus, you know, was resolving all these cases for a lot of people who wanted to know, you know, did Lucas, if Lucas said he killed, um, was he making it up or was it true? No, Jesus told him to tell, tell the, the ones he did. And there is a conversation with him and tool on the phone where they talk about it. And Lucas explains to them about his conversion to Christ and that, tool we need to tell the truth and don't say you killed somebody you didn't kill only tell the truth about what you did as i will so that's that's basically they they were taking responsibility and fulfilling what they were told what he was told by jesus to do okay <laughs> all right we are running out of time so um ta where can people find you and where can I find that fabulous book? <laughs> okay. Well, I don't need for anybody to find me. Don't come to her house. She doesn't like that. Don't call her. She doesn't like that. I, 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 I prefer to stay anonymous. Um, so this book, just like all the others, uh, just go underneath my name. Go to Amazon.com, True Crime. Uh, most all of them say a true crime investigative memoir. Um, because that's exactly what they are. I don't, uh, I write in what they call real time progressive revelation so that you as the reader understand exactly what I understand, not only as the investigator, but also as the psychic medium, because I get all kinds of information up front, like, um, like Penny was talking about in the very beginning of the Dixie mafia, I was shown this beautiful blonde. And she was standing in front of a building that intuitively I understood to be a movie theater. And she it, she had what they, they like to call the blocks blonde hair. And it was, she was really pretty. And she just, she had on bright red lipstick. And you know that the faux rabbit fur coats everybody used to wear in the 70s and whatever, the 60s and the 70s? Yeah, they're still, yeah, they're still wearing them. Wearing them. <laughs> I know, I probably still have one. Um and she was standing there, but she turned around and she just looked at me and she smiled and then she pulled her hair back like that. And then she smiled again and she just kind of like waved me on. And I thought, and then everything just kind of went whatever. And that turned out to be my calamity Jane. And it took me a hot minute to figure out who she was and where she was because she had been murdered. Um, Here's a real good thing for you. The mayor of Biloxi, uh, uh, Mississippi, or is it Gulf, Gulfport, or whatever. Um, he actually owns part of a cemetery. In the back part of a cemetery, he owns private land. And that's where she's buried. Oh. So I could not exhume her body because that portion of the cemetery Private land. is private land so i can't exhume it but i can prove that she was strangled to death she came through she showed me her strangulation um margaret sherry came through and told us about the document because in the vincent sherry vincent and margaret sherry murders the judge um they went after her two weeks before she was murdered they were murdered she said i've got the goods on you and i'm going to show them and she did. And we finally got the exact documents that she had that she was murdered for. And it's called, it's confidential. It's called the O'Keefe Cartel. And it lists wow. everybody who is involved in the mafia, the attorneys, the businesses, the distributors, the everything. Well, T.A., you are fabulous. Fabulous. You're so and kind. I definitely want you to come back. 
Well, if um, I can stay up this late. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you and me and, uh, Penny, do you have anything <laughs> that any yeah, right? Any last things to yawn out before we end feed? Yeah, I just wanted to tell people that you can find beyond, beyond the box. The box. Can everybody mute, please. Because I can't hear myself if I uh Brenda, can you mute for just a second? Um, so I want to tell everybody you can find us beyond the box um, every Friday and every Saturday. We're here at 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. That's Central Time or 10 to 12 midnight. And that's Eastern Time, which is that is kind of late. But hey, it's a bewitching hour. You need to know what we have, what we're going to present to you. We have a lot of different uh, people from from a lot of different spheres, political um writers directors entertainers super soldiers uh authors uh so you're you're going to find a a large uh body of individuals that are are very unique on this show so please join us uh this is brenda lankarge and suzanne hot um, they are the hosts of beyond the box i'm just the executive producer so i just do the things like the beginnings and the endings and then fill in when someone has to walk their dog and you can also find me on the Awake Nation. And we are there. It's with David Zublick. I'm his co-host, also the executive producer, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central and 9 to uh, 12 Eastern. And we hope to see you there. And if you want to call me, my phone number is 619-779-9771. Please text my phone because otherwise I won't answer unless you're in my contacts. And I like to be for people to text my phone because if I find out you're a psycho, I'm going to block you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tia, for coming. Thank you, Penny and Susie. Thank you, Norma. Um, Brent, y'all have a good night, and we will see you next weekend. Bye. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Goodbye for now from Beyond the Box. Inside, outside, upside, downside, Beyond the Box. Break it down. Please join us again for Beyond the Box Friday and Saturday evening from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central, from 10 p.m. to 12 Eastern. Join us for more Intel Bombs with our extraordinary guests. Good night, Putin. Good night, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> <laughs>